This is day five of the 2006 Idlewild Bible School. Our first period teacher is Brother Roger Lewis. His general topic is the four faces of Christ in the Gospels. Today's topic is four faces and four writers. Brother Lewis, please. Well, thank you, Brother Chairman, and good morning, my dear brothers and sisters, on this lovely, cool day, somewhat reminiscent of New Zealand temperatures. So if I look a little, a little more alert and sparkling this morning, it's because I'm starting to feel at home at last. <laughs> this morning, you might have noticed that our chairman gave a slightly different title to what's in your handbook. In the handbook, it said, Four Faces and Four Commissions. But in fact, what we've done in the course of our studies is looked at the commission or the close of each gospel record as part of our consideration of that face. So this morning what we hope to do instead is to look at the four faces and the four writers of those four faces. I believe that in the providence of God, Almighty God selected each man that was to pen, to paint, the particular portrait of Christ, and that that man was especially suited and changed that they might paint that face appropriately in the gospel that they would write. Just before I get on to those, though, I just want to mention a paradox with regard to the faces of the cherubim in the gospels. You may not have noticed this, but in fact there's a paradox to the faces. You see, what we have in the Gospel of Matthew is not just a lion, but a friendly lion. And the friendly lion will answer to the face of the merciful king, which is the type of king portrayed in this Gospel record. And in the Gospel of Mark, we don't just have an ox. We've got a gentle ox. And the gentle ox will answer to the face of the caring servant that will particularly be painted in the portrait of Mark's Gospel. In the Gospel of Luke, we don't just have a man. We have a weeping man. And the weeping man of Luke's gospel will answer to the sympathetic priest that will especially be drawn to our our attention in the face of the gospel of Luke. And lastly, and perhaps strangely, in the gospel of John, we're going to see a smiling eagle. And the smiling eagle is going to answer to the face of the loving judge which John is going to paint for us in his gospel record. There's a paradox, you see, to each of the faces. Well, let's have a look at the writers, shall we then, and see if we can see how how appropriate it was that this particular man on each occasion was selected in the providence of God to pen his gospel portrait. So what do we know about Matthew then? Well, if you come to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, we're told this in the list of the apostles. The the record says this, Matthew chapter 10. And reading from verse 2, it says, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. And the interesting thing in the list of the twelve apostles in Matthew 10, brothers and sisters, is that only one man has his occupation recorded. And that's Matthew the publican. Now, you see, publicans were an interesting group of people, were they not? In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 11, publicans are compared to sinners. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17, publicans are are compared to heathen. In Matthew chapter 21 verse 31, publicans are compared to harlots. 
They weren't exactly the most popular species on earth. And particularly not in the Jewish congregation. Jewish people are rather careful with their money. And the thought of having to pay tax over to other people was never a popular idea, but Matthew was one of the worst type of tax collectors. Actually, there were two different types, you know, in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ, two different types of publicanus. The first was the Gabbai, who really collected the local Jewish statutory taxes. Only 1% income tax, which sounds quite good, but... There were other taxes. There was a 0.30% poll tax. There was a 10% grain tax. There was a tax of 5% on anything else produced out of the land. And the Gabai collected the statutory taxes. But there was a second group of tax collectors called the Mokes. And the Mokes collected custom tax. They collected import and export taxes. And they also collected road user charges. The Romans had quite advanced ideas of taxation. And the interesting thing about the Mokes, that second class, and those taxes range from 2.5% to 12.5%, is that the Mokes worked directly for Rome. And Matthew was a Mokes. Matthew the publican worked for Rome. He collected the taxes on behalf of Rome. And when the decree came forth from the Caesar of Rome that all the world should be either enrolled or taxed, the Caesar knew what he wanted. And that tax demand would come filtering down through the various stages until it got to the local province of Judea and of Palestine, and it was up to the Mokes to collect that, plus add their margin. You see, this man... Matthew was joined to Caesar. He served the king of Rome. And that's what his other name means, isn't it? Levi joined. He was joined to Caesar's employee. He began service in Rome or to Rome and to the master of ambition. Matthew had never known a king who manifested mercy. Matthew collected tax on behalf of a Caesar, and he collected that tax without compromise, without discount, and without mercy. He was ruthlessly efficient in serving his king. But Matthew, of all men, was going to come into a contact with come into contact with a king of an altogether different sort that would change his life. Do you know, it's in Matthew chapter 17, interestingly enough, and only in the Gospel of Matthew, that we read this story. It's a tax story, and only in this Gospel. In Matthew 17, in verse 24, the record says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money, these are the temple taxes, came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? And he said, Yes. When he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter says unto him, Well, why of strangers? Jesus says unto him, Well, then, aren't the children free? And of course, the very point of the Lord's argument was that tax was taken of strangers, not the children of the kingdom. But Jesus was more than a child of the kingdom. He was the royal son of the kingdom. Why? The king designate himself. You don't take taxes of the king. But this man was merciful and had an altogether different spirit. And so he says, this king designate in verse 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, cast and hook, take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. And the Lord's attitude to tax, and even the paying of tribute, was quite different to the spirit that Matthew had known in serving his previous employer, king And isn't it in Matthew chapter 22 that it's not unique to Matthew, but we're not surprised to find it in Matthew's gospel. Do you remember the story of of when the Herodians came to Jesus 
and said in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 22, Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God. And of course, on the coin, brothers and sisters, was both the name and the face of Caesar, the name and the face, So Christ says, well, if the face on this coin is Caesar's and his name is on it, then that must belong to him. So pay that tax to him. But of course you realize the force of Matthew chapter 22 because you see in other parts of the scriptural record we're told, are we not, brothers and sisters, that we ourselves are made in the image of God and have his name named upon us. And the point of the Lord's teaching was, give the coin to Caesar, but you yourselves have the image of God stamped upon you and his name written upon you, so therefore you belong to God. So pay God's tax to him in loyal service of your life. And Matthew learned of a completely different type of tax, payable to a different type of king. You know, in Matthew chapter 9, we have the, actually in Matthew chapters 8 and 9, we have the story of of a collection of the miracles of Christ. There's a whole cascade of them in these two chapters. There's the miracle of the leper in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 1. There's the miracle of Peter's mother's wife in chapter 8 and verse 14. There's the miracle of the storm on the sea in chapter 8 and verse 23. There's the miracle of the healing of of the man of the Gergesenes in chapter 8 and verse 28. There's the miracle of the palsied man in chapter 9 and verse 1. There's going to be the miracle of the ruler in chapter 9 and verse 18. Of the woman diseased with blood in verse 20. Of two blind men in verse 27. Of a dumb man in verse 32. There's a whole cascade of miracles in Matthew 8 and 9. And right in the middle of those miracles... We have this story, brothers and sisters, in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, when the record says, and by the way, just before I start this, I might just mention that, you see, I believe that each gospel writer was not only selected by the Father to write the gospel portrait that he did, but that included in his gospel is a signature a particular thing inserted in the gospel record that really is Matthew's way of signing off his gospel. Well, here's Matthew's signature. It's this record, verse 9. As Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And Matthew's story is that here in the middle of all the miracles of Christ, he says the greatest miracle of all, as far as as I'm concerned, is the miracle of Christ's mercy in calling me a hated publican to the truth. And the shadow of Messiah fell athwart the tax desk. And Matthew, in service to the king of Rome, decided to join the service of the king of Israel. And he arose and followed him. And verse 10 says, It came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Oh, by the way, do you see what it says in verse 10? It came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house. But the other gospel records say it's Matthew's house, his own house. This was Matthew's farewell feast. 
He invited all the publicans because he was going to say goodbye to them. It's in this place, on this occasion, Matthew wasn't just leaving his occupation. He was renouncing his allegiance to one king and proclaiming loyalty to another. He was going to celebrate that he was leaving all of Caesar's world behind to join the service of the king of mercy. And isn't it remarkable that While they held the feast in Matthew's own house, at the very time, the Pharisees, verse 11, came and said to the disciples of Jesus, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And when Matthew had learned the principle of mercy, he was asked by Almighty God to write the gospel of the merciful king and paint the portrait of the cherub lion in the face of Christ. He was changed by contact with the Lord. So what about Mark then? Well, if you come to Acts chapter 13, we're told this concerning Mark. In the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 13, the the record says this. It's at the beginning of the first missionary journey. We're told that when Paul and Barnabas had been separated, well, verse 2 says, Acts 13, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. The work. Notice that key word, by the way, because this is the gospel now of the face of the ox, the face of labor and service of work in the truth. And so Barnabas and Saul are separated for the work of the truth. And it says in verse 5 that when they got to Cyprus, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John to their minister, says the record. John, whose surname was Mark. So John was with them as a minister. The word is huperites, which means an attendant or an assistant. John Mark was there to help Paul and Barnabas in the work of the service of their preaching. But verse 13 says this. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John left them. John left the work. John left his role as a servant or a minister. We're not told why, but if you come to chapter 15, clearly there was a problem here with regard to Mark's development of thinking at this stage, because in Acts chapter 15, it says this, verse 37, when they decided to make another missionary journey, verse 37 says, Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Ah, so the very problem that Mark had was he didn't understand the spirit of service. He did not have a a proper commitment to the service of the truth. He let them down. So time was going to be needed to mature Mark's faith. Just as Matthew's character had to be changed, so did Mark's. And there was nothing personal in it, by the way, when Paul said that he didn't want to take him. It it wasn't anything personal towards Mark. It was simply his lack of maturity in dedicated service. Well, the lovely thing about the story of Mark, brothers and sisters, which we must needs abbreviate this morning, is that his faith clearly did mature. And let me just give you two references that we won't turn up, but you might like to take a note of. The first is in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, when it says, verses 10 and 11, when it says, Marcus, 
my fellow worker unto the kingdom. Marcus, my fellow worker unto the kingdom, says the Apostle Paul. And again in Philemon, verse 24, he calls Mark, my fellow laborer. Do you notice those two phrases? My fellow worker, my fellow laborer. Why, those are the words of service, aren't they? And now come to the last chapter of the last epistle that the Apostle Paul ever wrote, which is, of course, the second of Timothy. If you come to the second of Timothy in chapter 4, we're told this. Paul's imprisonment. He says this in second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Gal Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And then he says, Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry, for the service. He's profitable to me for the service. So you see, Mark had developed now to the point where he understood the true spirit of service in the truth. He's profitable for the ministry, says Paul. Bring him along. Especially remember to bring Mark. And now come to Mark's signature in the gospel. Where's Mark's signature in his gospel? Well, I think it's probably in Mark chapter 14. And the story of a certain moment in the garden of Gethsemane. And you'll remember that the record says in Mark 14, when this band of soldiers and lanterns and swords and torches all came to take Christ in the garden. It says of his disciples in verse 50, and they all forsook him and fled. And then Mark's gospel records a peculiar account that only Mark records when it says in verse 51, and there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body and the young men laid hold on him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I think that was John Mark. We're told in the book of Acts that the brethren used to meet in those days in the house of John Mark's mother, says Acts chapter 12. One suspects that the upper room might have been in that house. And that in fact what happened was that after the feast, Judas having already left, that John Mark went to bed and that lying in his bed as a young man there suddenly came a knock at the door and in the doorway below Mark as he looked out the window could see Judas and all of those that were gathered that they might take Christ and Mark thought I must warn the Lord so he jumps out of bed wraps a linen cloth about him and races by a different route to the garden of Gethsemane where he knew the Lord was wont to go that he might warn Christ but he got there too late by the time he arrived the soldiers were already there and verse 51 says there followed a certain young man having a linen cloth and when the young men laid hold on him he also forsook the Lord and fled I think that was John Mark, you see, brothers and sisters. And the story is that John Mark fled because he had not yet learned the spirit of faithful service at the time this moment happened in his life. This is his salute to Christ that as yet he did not understand. And the reason, brothers and sisters, why Mark did not yet know faithful servant is because he didn't care enough. He didn't care enough about Christ. But he would learn. And when he had learned, and when he had become profitable for the ministry, God said to Mark, and now I'd like you to write the gospel of the caring servant and paint the portrait of the ox concerning my son. 
Oh, yes, I think the Lord chose the right man, brothers and sisters, don't you? To paint that portrait. So what do we know about Luke then? And the gospel of the face of the man. Well, if you come to Colossians chapter 4, we're told this concerning Luke. It's something that we all know, but I wonder if you know quite as much as you think you do. In Colossians chapter 4, we're told this. It says, in Colossians 4 and verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician. Ah, so Luke was a doctor. Luke was a doctor. And you see, that made him especially suited for the particular portrait that he would paint of our Lord Jesus Christ, would it not? For this reason, brothers and sisters, and I just want you to think about the suitability of Luke's capacity as a doctor to paint the portrait of the weeping man. Because you see, a doctor was to disease what a priest was to sin. The one deals in physical weakness. The other deals in spiritual infirmity. The one has patience to heal. The other has sinners to save. But they're of the same spirit, are they not? You see, both doctors and priests were channels of healing they're both focused on the deliverance of those that they minister among. And in fact, in the book of the law, it came to the climax where leprosy was treated not by doctors, but by coming to the priest. And Luke's training as a doctor made him especially suitable for this particular work that he would have of painting this portrait. But I think he was more than a doctor. He was a particular type of doctor. Because you see what Colossians says. It says verse 10, Marcus, sister's son. Verse 11, and Jesus who is called Justice. And, and then it says, who are, who are these ones are of the circumcision. And then it says, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom. And having said that, he then goes on to mention Epaphras in verse 12, Luke in verse 14, Nymphus in verse 15, Archippus in verse 17, who clearly also assisted Paul. Are they not also fellow workers? What does the Lord, what does Paul mean in verse 11 when he says, these only are my fellow workers? Well, you see, I think the answer is that the fellow workers that he's enumerated, as verse 11 says, are those of the circumcision. But Luke is mentioned later in, a, in the chapter as being one of those who labored with the apostle, who clearly was not of the circumcision, but of the Gentiles. So he wasn't just a doctor, he was a Gentile doctor. And in fact, I'm going to suggest to you, and unfortunately I haven't got the time to really develop this theme this morning, but I think he was more than a Gentile doctor. I think quite possibly that Luke was a Samaritan doctor. And I say so for two key reasons. The first is that when we come to the Gospel of Luke, we have this strange feature, especially if Luke was a Gentile, that here is a writer who has intimate knowledge of the Jewish law and quotes extensively from the Septuagint version. A strange thing were Luke to be completely a Gentile. But the Samaritans, you see, had a special Pentateuch of their own, the Samaritan Pentateuch, that was extremely similar to the Septuagint translation. And in this gospel, the gospel of Luke, we will find the most extensive references to the Septuagint translation of the gospel writers. I think this man already understood these things because he came not from a Gentile background, but from a Samaritan one. He already knew the law of Moses. And the second thing is that do you know that apart from Christ's first work with the Samaritans, recorded in John chapter 4, Every single thing we know about contact with the Samaritans as a people, every single thing 
is recorded by Luke and only by Luke. Every other moment of contact, every other episode involving Samaritans is chronicled by Luke alone. I think Luke was a Samaritan, a person despised. Now, do you know the one thing by training that Luke lacked was this? As a doctor, however careful he might be with and for his patients, he would be taught as a medical practitioner to be professionally detached. Never become emotionally involved in the patient you're healing. But I believe that this man came into contact with Christ who cared for him, a Gentile. And he learned the one thing that his training had not taught him. He saw the face of a compassionate man who cared beyond all bounds that he'd ever seen before for those that he came to labor among. And I think when when Luke saw the face of that man, I think that Luke met Christ, by the way. I think that Luke knew Christ. And I think he was touched by him. And he was changed so that he might write, write the story of this particular gospel record having known Christ. Do you know where the signature is in Luke's gospel? I think it's in Luke chapter 10. There's a parable in Luke chapter 10. This particular parable is only found in Luke's Gospel. Only Luke writes this special story that clearly came from the mouth of the Lord. And it's the story of a wounded man. And the record says in Luke chapter 10, and just notice what it does say, by the way, it says in verse 31 that a certain priest came down and passed by on the other side Verse 32, and likewise, a Levite that looked and passed by on the other side. And one of the things of the parable of the Good Samaritan, brothers and sisters, will be that the people who should have shown compassion, the priest and the Levite, never did so. And this gospel will present instead the story of the true priest who does show compassion. But it's not a priest in Luke 10. It says, strangely, in verse 33, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and took him to an inn and took care of him. He had compassion, verse 33, and he showed care, verse 34. But you know what's really interesting about the parable of the Good Samaritan, brothers and sisters? It's this. Verse 34. What man would be traveling on the road who, when coming across such an one grievously wounded, would be able to bring bandages and ointments out of his bag But a doctor. See, I think the Good Samaritan was a doctor. And I wonder whether this parable was related to the life of Luke himself, who'd met the Lord. And when Luke had met the Lord, brothers and sisters, and been changed by him, he was asked to write the gospel of the sympathetic priest who cared so much for others and who always had the resources there that he might heal them. Oh yes, I I think God chose the right man to write the gospel, did he not? So what do we know then about the man John? Well, if you come to Mark chapter 3, we're, we're told this concerning John the Apostle. 
In Mark chapter 3, it says this at the Mark record of the choosing of the apostles. It says in verse 16 of Mark 3, Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the son, sons of thunder. Boanerges is the Greek form of two Hebrew words, ben ragaz. Ben means son, and ragaz means in the Hebrew literally to quiver with any violent emotion, either rage or grief or anger, wrath, joy, whatever it was. It means to quiver with violent emotion. John was an intense man. Yeah, that was his problem. John was a very intense man in his feelings, and he felt very passionately about our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you three illustrations out of the life of John. The first one is in Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, we're told this. In verse 38, the record says of Mark 9, John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. And Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. He that's not against us is on our part. John, do not forbid. And you see, what happens in Mark chapter 9 is that John is rebuked for short-sighted aggressiveness. Because he was anxious to exclude others who lacked the commitment to follow Christ. Such was the intensity of his feelings for his Lord. And now come to Luke chapter 9. Here's a second episode that shows the characteristic of John, the son of thunder. John Boanerges. Here he is, Luke chapter 9. Verse 51 says, it came to pass that when Jesus should be received up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And you see, in Luke chapter 9, John is rebuked for vindictive intolerance. Because he was zealous to exclude others who lacked the respect to honor Christ. He was happy to blast them off the face of the earth. That's not the spirit, says Jesus. And now come back to Mark chapter 10. One final episode that shows the character of the man that would be called to write the gospel of the smiling eagle. In Mark chapter 10, verse 35, it says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And the Lord, with commendable caution, said, um, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. And Jesus says, You do not know what you ask. And in the intensity of John's passion to be associated with Christ, on this occasion he is rebuked for thoughtless ambition because he was prepared to exclude others who lacked the desire to be with Christ like he did. Oh, he's a strong man, this one, isn't he, brothers and sisters? But now this man is going to come face to face with the most surprising judge that he'd ever seen. Come and have a look at the words of John chapter 5 and see the spirit of the judge whose portrait is penned for us in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 5, 
It says this in verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. And the remarkable thing about this particular gospel is that the objectives of the ju- the objective of the judge's words are not that he might condemn to death, but that he might bring to life. All they had to do was believe the words of the judge. If they believed him, they could live. If they did not believe him, they would die, but they would judge themselves. But you see, the drama of the Gospel of John, brothers and sisters, the tremendous feature of this Gospel is that he was the only judge that could sit before them and bring in a verdict of acquittal to eternal life. The whole desire of this judge was not to bring down the sentence of death but the sentence of life for all if they would just believe his words because his words were the words of God. John chapter 20. Do you remember at the end of the miracles before the postscript to the gospel? At the very end of John chapter 20, the record says, see, this is the spirit of the man of this gospel. John 20 verse 30 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, ye might have life through his name. And you see, this was the judge who actually wanted to acquit them and not condemn them. Do you know that love is a key word in the Gospel of John? The Gospel of the judge has the word love as a key word. Forty-seven times in this Gospel, agape and philia are used, compared to 35 combined in the other Gospels. It's a key idea And this is what John was going to have to learn, you see, as he had contact with Christ. In the words of a hymn, Here where the sun of thunder learns the thought that breathes and word that burns, here where on eagle wings we move with him whose last best creed is love. And that's the thing that John had to learn, you see. And finally, he came face to face in his own life with the loving judge. Do you know the signature of John's gospel, brothers and sisters? Come and have a look at John chapter 13. Time does not permit us to actually follow the sequence through, but if I mention them, you'll no doubt find them. We'll just look at the beginning and the end of the sequence. In John 13, in verse 21, Jesus was troubled in spirit and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Of course, that's John himself, isn't it, brothers and sisters? This man who wanted to exclude all else in his passion and zeal for Christ finally learnt that the Lord loved him. And do you know what the Lord, do you know what John saw on the occasion of this one remarkable night, brothers and sisters? He leaned on the bosom of Christ and he said to Christ, he whispered to Christ, Who is it, Lord? And Jesus said to John alone, It's the one I give the sop to. And John watched with fascinated eye as Jesus gave the sop to Judas and loved him. And John would see this night 
that the Lord who loved Judas also found time to answer the question of Thomas and the question of Philip and the question of Judas who was not Iscariot and to heal Malchus's ear and to look kindly upon Peter. And finally, in John chapter 19, as he draws near to the cross, the record's going to tell us in John 19 and verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. And at the very point, brothers and sisters, almost of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he looked out and saw his mother that night and showed love for her and saw John. And there's no pride, brothers and sisters, in John's gospel when he calls himself, for this is his signature, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It was actually the turning point in his life. Because he'd come face to face with the loving judge, he who would gladly have excluded others, and he saw a man, he found a man, he understood a man who never excluded anyone in all his work. And when John had come face to face with that man, Almighty God said to him, and now I want you to write the gospel of the loving judge and paint the portrait of the evil face of the cherubim in my son. Oh, I think these men, brothers and sisters, were not only chosen of God and not only suited to write their gospel portraits, but were changed in the process, were they not? And if they could be changed, brothers and sisters, so surely must we, when we look upon the faces. But then that, brothers and sisters, is our story for tomorrow.